Shannon is the Civil Resolution Tribunal's chair and an adjunct professor at the University of British Columbia Allard School of Law, where she teaches in administrative law and legal ethics. She recently um, was named one of the top 25 most influential lawyers in Canada. And she has received several awards for her access to justice work. She was an all-star, named an all-star by the National Self-Represented Litigants Project. Um, and she also has been received awards for her work as an adjunct professor. So an excellent teacher and presents um, all around the world on these issues. We're really excited to hear your talk about online dispute resolution. Shannon? Well, thank you very much uh, to DLA Piper and to the PIL network for uh, inviting me to speak today. It's a real pleasure to be back in London and to speak with all of you. I've been listening with a lot of interest to the variety of perspectives we've heard from this morning, and that's a tough crowd to follow. But particularly, a lot of what uh, Mar uh, Margaret spoke about just now really spoke to me in terms of our early fumbles in trying to establish the civil resolution tribunal, as well as uh, some of our hard-fought lessons over time. So I'm keen to share those with you uh, and be as candid as I can about uh, the pitfalls of actually implementing a lot of the theory around online dispute resolution. Um, and I also did want to just acknowledge uh, Sandy Seppi, who's in the audience here P with P PwC. PwC is the technology partner uh, that the Ministry of Justice in British Columbia procured um, to help build some of the technology I'm about to show you. So what is the Civil Resolution Tribunal? It is part of the public justice system in British Columbia. And what I mean by that is that it's an administrative tribunal. We have about 29 administrative tribunals in British Columbia. For those of you from the States, it's kind of like an administrative court. And for those of you from here, I don't have to explain what a tribunal is, which is a bit of a relief. But the thing that uh, makes the CRT a bit different, or did anyway, in the online dispute resolution world when it opened in 2016, is that it's an example of ODR being used in a public justice context. And until that point, the most high profile examples of ODR came from the e-commerce world. You've heard the cited statistics from PayPal and eBay. We took some of the uh, thought behind that and thought about how we could translate that into a public justice context. So we were the first online tribunal in Canada. At the time, I think we were the only one in the world. But since then, in three short years, there's examples all over the world now of online dispute resolution being implemented in the public justice system. And because of our use of technology, which as you're about to see, is not actually particularly cutting edge technology, uh, we get invited to speak at conferences like this one. But in my view, the online part of the tribunal is really quite secondary to what it is we're trying to accomplish. Our greater mandate is to take the public justice system, or at least the increasing corner of it with which we've been entrusted, and bring it to people and build it around their lives and account for the disparities that many people have in terms of their skills and abilities and challenges, where they live, how they live, with whom they live. Um, a lot of the kinds of circumstances that Hazel spoke about uh, so eloquently earlier. So we want to bring the justice system to people. We don't want to merely put it online. But if you are going to bring the justice system to people, having online tools in a modern age is a pretty good starting point. A lot of the things, though, that we do to build inclusivity in the tribunal are actually pretty analog, though. They're offline. And one of my key messages to audiences like this one, but also to court administrators and judges, uh, who often tell me, well, we can't do anything because we don't have your fancy technology, is a reminder that when we opened three years ago, we started with an online uh, form, a website, and then behind the scenes, two lockdown Excel spreadsheets and a SharePoint site. And with that, we did online dispute resolution. And Sandy's nodding in the back because he knows that's true. We've come a long way since then, but my point is this. One, online dispute resolution is not a panacea, but what it does do is invites us to think critically about why it is we do things the way we do. Uh, I'm not uh, a, a huge um, uh, evangelist for ODR in and of itself, but it is a useful tool in the context of re-examining all of the processes that we use, many of which, if you dig a little bit, and the academics in this room know this, are not supported by any empirical data. 
In fact, they seem to be developed because somebody along the line thought it was a good idea at some point, and then that was around William the Conqueror, and we've just done it for a millennia. And that is disturbing. It's disturbing because the more we dig, the more we look, the more we develop new processes from the ground up, the more we see that some of the things we did because at some point somebody had a half-formed notion actually served to impede access to justice. And I'll give you some examples of that as we go through. So my first point is that uh, online dispute resolution by itself doesn't necessarily improve access to justice. But even more than that, just digitalizing stuff doesn't necessarily improve access to justice. And in fact, it can, in fact, really impede access to justice. And I think we've got uh, a really good lecture this afternoon, a panel that uh, Natalie Byram and others are on about the difference between merely digitizing processes and actually transforming them. So you don't actually need to be online to transform processes. So again, going back to those rooms full of court administrators and judges, all you really need is a clipboard and the desire to walk outside your registry and get in line with the people who are in line uh, to use those services and start asking them some questions. Uh, what took you here today? How long did it take? Who helped you along the way? How much did it cost you? Did you have to arrange childcare? Did you have to take time off work? Uh, did you ever have any legal help? How many times have you been here? Um, how many counters did you have to go to before you found the right one? What's worrying you most about this? Um, those are pretty basic questions, and if you want to take a next step, you can even take your form and ask people to fill it out and then do some observational user testing uh, by observing where it is they, they run into trouble. So I guess my point is that we can all do something no matter where we are, no matter what tools we have, um, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we've approached this problem. We've had a short uh, but pretty exciting uh, history in the justice fabric in British Columbia. As I mentioned, we started in 2016. We opened our doors for condominium disputes. And we get about 600 or so of those every year. By way of background, before we started handling condominium disputes, you had to go to our superior court in British Columbia. And this was true regardless of whether or not you wanted to contest a fine that your condominium board gave you, or whether you were just merely annoyed by the color of paint in the hallway or the yapping dog next door to you. So quite a complicated, expensive dispute resolution mechanism for what tend to be pretty basic everyday problems between neighbors in these little communities. But these communities constitute about half of our residential housing stock in British Columbia. Sorry. So it was a very um, vocal and uh, pretty well-resourced group of people who were advocating for a new dispute resolution method. And that was helpful because it gave us a good starting point and it gave uh, the, the government in British Columbia a, a pretty good uh, case type to, to try out ODR. We managed to uh, only do those kinds of disputes for about a year before the legislature in British Columbia Parliament gave us jurisdiction over small claims disputes, $5,000 and under. Uh, small claims disputes, as many of you are aware, are just everyday debt, uh, contract, personal property issues. We get a lot of uh, people who have bought things on Craigslist that don't work, for example. Um, and these also uh, were going to court before we assumed jurisdiction. So we get about 5,000 of those cases every year, so we're now up to about 5,600 uh, uh, disputes every year. And then because we're not given any time to rest on our laurels, last May uh, the government announced pretty sweeping changes to motor vehicle accident uh, legis uh, uh, compensation uh, schemes in British Columbia. We have a public auto insurer that provides mandatory auto insurance and it's backed by taxpayers and it was in debt to the tune of a billion dollars a year. Canadian dollars, not pounds, lest you be alarmed. Um, <laughs> significantly less, uh, but still a sizable amount uh, for us in, uh, in Canada. And so the government introduced a massive uh, package of changes but a big cornerstone of those changes was bringing what we anticipate to be 80% of all motor vehicle disputes in British Columbia within the jurisdiction of the Civil Resolution Tribunal. So we're now two months into that. Thankfully, we only get jurisdiction over accidents that happen April 1st and after, and so we have uh, two cases. And my staff advised me that they've both settled. So the good news is we have a 100% resolution rate. Uh, that's not going to hold. But we expect that we're going to have 10,000 of these disputes this coming year, and then another 30,000 of these disputes every year thereafter. So for those of you who are better at math than I am, 
Uh, we're now looking at uh, case volumes a year from now that will be about 35,000, possibly upwards of 40,000 cases per year. And these cases too were previously going to the uh, Superior Court in British Columbia on a full tort basis. So this is a pretty big change, not just for the courts, not just for British Columbians, but particularly for lawyers, and in particular for personal injury lawyers who I think, uh, to put it delicately, are quite displeased by this change among others. And then we also, as a bit of a footnote, have jurisdiction over non disputes involving societies and non-profit associations and cooperative associations. So there's a bit of a, a deep dive there into British Columbia law That's as far as that's going to go because I know that's not what you're interested in. But I think it does illustrate an important point, which is that if you're going to test out something novel, it really makes sense to carefully pick your dispute type. Pick an area where, uh, while these disputes are important to the people who have them, Nobody is losing their children over condominium disputes or small claims. Nobody is being imprisoned because of these disputes. And so it gave us a safe zone to be able to iterate, uh, which we're still doing, but to make sure that the basics worked before we extended it to new areas of uh, jurisdiction. And so this is a basic snapshot of how this works. The idea is that we give people free upfront legal information and tools through something called an expert system. Uh, we call that the solution explorer. And then, ideally, they don't even have to come to us at all. They have a template letter that they can send to the person they're in a dispute with. They have tools to help them figure out if they actually have a legal claim. And if they want to, though, they can seamlessly apply for dispute resolution from that page. They fill out a pretty basic form. We take care of serving the respondent uh, in most cases. And when the respondent comes back, the parties have a chance to negotiate. And this is voluntary. Uh, the negotiation platform looks very much like Facebook Messenger or any other chatting app that you're familiar with. And as a, as a sideline, we've discovered that through user testing that not surprisingly, to the extent that you can design technology, legal technology, to look like what people are already doing, uh, they're going to have fewer problems using it. Not really rocket science, but not something that is taken on board by a lot of legal institutions. Um, so a lot of our technology kind of looks like social media. It kind of looks like what you'd have to do to buy something on Amazon or to chat through a, a web chat messenger app. So parties have an opportunity to negotiate. They don't have to. But this currently resolves about 10% of disputes, and or small claims disputes, sorry. And if people can reach an agreement, then we refund their application fee, and we can turn their agreement into a tribunal order, which is also enforceable as a court order. Uh, most people, though, need help, and that's when our mediators get involved. That's the fourth step there. And the mediators are really flexible. They work with the parties through whatever communication method they prefer, using whatever tools they prefer, and ideally help them reach an agreement, which also can be turned into a tribunal order. Last but not least, we have adjudication. That is the least innovative part of this because it's at this point that we are making a decision based on the law, based on people's submissions, and uh, of course, we're bound by administrative law and the common law generally. One difference, though, is that in most cases, people choose to upload their evidence through their phone or otherwise electronically, as well as their submissions. And in most cases, they get their uh, decision by email as well. I say most cases because we, as a public access to justice project, have to offer lots of channels for people to engage. So when we talk about the digital divide, I think that's an important thing. The, digital divide is closing. It's closing pretty quickly, but it's closing among some people more than it is for others. Um, our experience is that out of now handling about 11,000 disputes, we've had less than 20 people, people um, ask not to use email, which we've accommodated. We also offer paper forms, uh, telephone service, in-person service at 60 government service points around the province. Um, and, and take other steps, too, to make sure that people can engage, usually by working with advocates. But the point is that uh, you have to offer lots of different ways for people to engage, and that's a, one of the ways that we can make sure that people are not falling through the cracks. Despite that, I think it is important to note that over 99.9% .9 of people are choosing email service or web portal service. And so I think if you can design uh, technology properly, then people in many cases would rather sit down with a son or daughter or family member in the evening um, and work out how to fill out a form on their iPad even more than standing up in line uh, to get a postage stamp. So 
The idea here is that we take the traditional civil justice model and flip it on its head in some ways. The traditional model is based on the idea that if you take the time and you have the resources to be able to go down to the court and file your documents, then at some point, months or years later, you're going to end up in front of a judge. And we know that that is not true 98% of the time. Uh, it's not true in Canada 98% of the time, but it's also not true here or in Australia or in US district courts either. Instead, what happens is a good chunk of those 98% of cases settle, uh, especially ones where there are lawyers involved. But in many cases, people just give up. And uh, through attrition, they go away. But their underlying dispute doesn't get resolved. They just run out of time and money and energy. And I think for, for a lot of the reasons that uh, Hazel described earlier. So we start from the proposition that you're not going to end up in front of a tribunal member like me, um, because that's the most likely outcome. But you still need help and support. You still have the problem that needs to be resolved. And so we provide a lot of upfront service to try and resolve disputes as quickly and as inexpensively as possible. And then we add resources as it becomes clear that the problem is a bit more uh, complicated or difficult to resolve. So the Solution Explorer, for example, is massively popular. We've had over 60,000 explorations, which given our modest population is pretty significant. A far fewer number of people go on to apply for dispute resolution, but the odds are really good that they will resolve their dispute either at negotiation or through the help of a mediator. Only about 6% of our small claims go to a tribunal member, only about 24% of the condominium ones do. And we'll see with motor vehicle disputes, but I suspect it'll be pretty similar as well. Um, the website looks like this. It was designed first and foremost uh, to look good and work well on a smartphone without having to download any apps. Uh, so for a lot of the reasons that Margaret said, we wanted people to be able to find their way here through a lot of different ways. We invested in Google Ads to make sure that we appeared front and center uh, when you Google small claims or debt problems or contract problems or condominium problems. Um, and we don't want people to have to download any special apps to be able to access our, our services. We use responsive design, so it just seamlessly moves between different devices and works well on all of them. But you can handle the entire claim from using the Solution Explorer, filling out an application form, responding to settlement agreements or offers, uploading evidence and submissions, and then even reading your decision all from your smartphone, all from your couch, wherever you happen to be. Um, so I'm going to show you a little bit about how this works. This is our, our web page, as I mentioned. Um, you can play along at home or here if you'd like as well because the front end of this doesn't require any passwords. It's, uh, the Solution Explorer is free and anonymous to use. Um, we do start collecting personal information when somebody decides to apply for dispute resolution because that's uh, necessary at that point. But up until that point, it's really just offering people free legal information and tools. Um, so the idea behind the Solution Explorer is that, as Margaret said, providing really general uh, chunks of legal information is not very actionable for people. Arguably, even providing little bite-sized chunks of plain language legal information may not be very actionable for some people either. But it's, it's better than what we have now. And so the idea is that the Solution Explorer replicates sitting down with an expert. Yeah, for those of you who've done bar courses, because this seems to be a feature everywhere in the world I go to, it's like the funnel in the client interview. You ask the broad question, you take their answer and ask more narrow questions until you can zero in on the problem enough to give people legal tools. So we ask questions, we give tools, we ask more questions, we give options, and along the way we collect a lot of feedback which we use to improve the system over time. And by time I mean quarterly. The entire uh, system is refreshed every quarter and we publish a blog post explaining what we've changed, why we've changed it, and we measure it over time. Um, and that's because we collect so much feedback from people. The feedback all goes into something we affectionately call the treasure trove. Um, and as Sandy will tell you, we action all of those uh, requests and the need for changes over time. Uh, so it, and the Solution Explorer, like everything else in the CRT, is really the product of wherever possible co-designing with the public, and particularly co-designing with community legal advocates. So our methodology for user testing, which we learned the hard way, is to start always with community legal advocates who represent people with the most significant barriers. Ideally, you'd want to start with those clients directly, and, and Margaret's done a really good job of uh, showing how that's possible. 
in our experience, it's really tough sometimes to get the attention of people with significant barriers um, because, frankly, they have more significant problems and more significant uh, priorities sometimes than user testing our small claim software. But as a proxy, um, having community advocates is pretty effective because they're able to take their experience on the front line serving hundreds, sometimes thousands of people and tell us at a glance what's going to work for their clients and what's going to be a problem. So our methodology usually involves taking whatever it is we've designed as a conceptual design, having uh, community legal advocates from around the province join a screen share with our UX person in real time and then having them beat up whatever it is we've created. You know, they might say, for example, my clients won't understand what selection means. Can we use a different word? Or my client with uh, a mental health issue might find this particularly triggering or upsetting. And so we're able to see what we design from a variety of perspectives and in real time make changes. And that's important not just because it's valuable for us in terms of making sure people don't fall through the cracks, but it's been key in terms of building goodwill and developing the social licenses necessary to do this project. Because advocates know that we're not just checking a box that their feedback is central to everything that we do and that we're always going to prioritize what they have to say above what anyone else has to say about this. Um, so we start with those advocates, we make a ton of changes, then often we'll also do public testing with random members of the public. This was particularly important early on, um, but we had members of the public fill out our forms and tell us what they understood, what they didn't understand, what was confusing, where they ran into problems. Now that we're operational, we get a lot of that feedback in real time too, which is really helpful with actual users, and we use that to improve. And then last but not least, we test with lawyers and other legal stakeholders. And that's good from an errors and omissions perspective, but it's a terrible place to start, and we learned that the hard way. Because we used to start with a room full of lawyers and have them beat up a form, for example, tell us what we got right or what we got wrong. But what would happen is, we'd have each lawyer in turn tell us about some crazy thing that happened in their 25 years of practice. This total edge case, and it was really a horrible headache for them, and it would have been a lot better had there been a rule about it, or a field in a forum that would have captured that. And that's my theory. My theory is that multiplied across a room like that, a room like this even, that's how we get uh, 2,000 page procedural guides. In, our, in British Columbia, we call it the white book. It's that thick, and I pull, there's always one kicking around the law school, so I always pull it out to horrify the, my law students sometimes. But the reality is that what you need for 99.9% .9 of people is probably just a very small handful of fields, a very small handful of rules, and every time you add on to that, you lose people along the way. So that's our methodology. That's a bit of a pause there, but we've used that to develop the Solution Explorer. And we're constantly uh, reiterating and iterating and reiterating with this. So I'm going to show you a few uh, screenshots here, but please feel free to take a look and play around with it. Um, rate things. Tell us if you happen to know more about British Columbia law than we do. Please tell us where we've gotten things wrong. Um, but I'm going to show you some screenshots for our new jurisdiction over motor vehicle disputes. So we can make these three kinds of determinations, and only really these three kinds of determinations. And so we're helping to focus people's um, attention on what it is we can resolve and what we can't resolve. Uh, so people can pick one or more of these and we, the system leads them through each issue in turn. And so the idea is you ask questions and then we give people plain language legal information. Um, this is about two and a bit pages. Everything we um, write, whether it's a Solution Explorer, our website, all the way up to our decisions are meant to be at about a grade six reading level. Um, Hazel talked about the average reading age uh, in, in the UK earlier. In Canada, it's about grade six. But some people think that's actually pretty high because, for example, 45% of our population in BC doesn't speak English as a first language. And I don't know that those people are properly considered when uh, we establish those reading levels. Um, there's some good online tools, by the way, that are free that you can use to cut and paste your content into, and it'll spit out a reading level. And you'll probably be surprised as I was at, um, at how high that reading level is despite your best efforts. So we're pretty good on this side, on the front end, at writing at in plain language. Candidly, we struggle more at the decision writing stage, and that's because all of our tribunal members are lawyers, and it's really difficult despite boot camps and lots of training to deprogram all of us in terms of our legal education and the language that we use. But nevertheless, that's what we're endeavoring to do. So we offer uh, plain language tools like this. We want to tell people what our jurisdiction is, what can we decide, what can't we decide, 
to make sure they're at the right place and they find out early before they've invested time and money. People can rate this resource. There's five stars up there. There's also that red not helpful button. This is information that comes to us right away and is used in that quarterly refresh. So if this thing is getting a lot of half stars, uh, we know we need to pull it and do something different. Uh, this is another example of a resource we give people. People, uh, n not surprisingly, struggle with the idea of what damages means. We use damages as a legal term a lot, but in the motor vehicle context, it means all of these specific things, um, pain and suffering, past income loss, future income loss, and so on. So we try and explain using icons and, um, and, and plain language what that means. But Hazel raises a good point too about literacy because there are some people for whom even this is going to be too complicated. And that's where we really have this culture of trying to welcome helpers. That's an analog thing that we do. Um, try to make it a, a place where it's easy for you to get somebody to assist you. Building, and, and part of that is for us building really strong relationships with advocates, making sure that we're training advocates on how the CRT works so that they can serve people, that we're supporting them uh, in the work that they do. And to Margaret's point about going to where people are, um, our strategy with that depends on the area of jurisdiction. But in British Columbia, a lot of people go to public libraries for legal help. And the public librarians there, of course, are not lawyers. They don't even have legal expertise. They weren't expecting to be the source for this legal help. So we do a lot of work with public libraries to give them um, business cards or uh, rack cards that they can give out to people, as well as webinar training uh, to help them help other people. So to the extent that we can support helpers through this process and we can listen to them and figure out how to make it easier for them, then we're also making sure that even even though we try to design this to be as accessible as possible, we're not leaving people behind in, in the midst of it. Um, so we give people legal information, then we can pivot to asking them what they'd like to do next. Do you want to counter offer to the insured? Do you want to get professional advice? This takes people to links for pro bono services and low bono services, or you can file a, a claim with the CRT. And as we show people uh, resources, they stack up usually on the left-hand side if you scroll down. There's also a bit of a breadcrumb trail there so people can figure out how it is they got to this page. And I could probably spend half an hour telling you about all the very sort of paternalistic things that we got wrong about this initially before we developed a decent user testing methodology. Um, but I'll just stop by giving you one example. We used to, in the very, very early days of this, it was primarily a bunch of lawyers and IT professionals um, on a conference call talking about what this should look like and how it should function. And what I discovered that lawyers and IT professionals have in common is that we both tend to be pretty linear thinkers about problems. If you have problem A, uh, then you should do B or C. And if you do C, you should think about D or E or F. And it turned out through user testing that uh, that's not at all how people with legal problems think. They tend to uh, click through on all of these things until they hit the first piece of information they think is relevant to them. And then they might work backwards or jump around. But we designed this thing so that if you tried to go back, a very patronizing and retrospect little box would pop up and say, are you sure? Do you really know what's best for you? It didn't really say that, but I'm paraphrasing. That was the tone of it in retrospect. Um, so we didn't let people do what they needed to do, which is behave like humans with problems. So that's one example of, of things that we got wrong. And we took a lot from that early user testing. And the biggest thing we, we took is that as IT professionals and lawyers, when we start speculating about public preference or behavior, we're almost always wrong. And that's a red flag that we have to go out and user test. So this is an example of one of the tools that we have. It's just a simple worksheet that lets people calculate how much they should be claiming. Uh, it's not uh, terribly complicated or sophisticated, but we are working on more online calculators for this. And then this tool is an example of the most popular thing that we have in the Solution Explorer. It's a pre-written template letter, in this case, to uh, make a counteroffer to an insurer. But there are ones for having a hearing with your condominium board, um, asking for a repayment plan with your financial uh, institution, targeted to the information people have now given us about their dispute. And as those of you uh, in the pro bono community know, people really struggle with these letters, writing them themselves. And so the fall off rate after this letter, these letter templates is huge. Uh, people tend to take their letter and go. 
But you can fill this out from your smartphone. You don't need to have Microsoft Word or any other software. You can use a public library as well to complete it. For people who do get past the letter stage, though, they're taken to a summary report where we give them links to all of the resources as well as a plain language summary of their dispute. And people can scroll down from this page and start applying for dispute resolution if they've concluded that they can't resolve the dispute on their own. And that takes them to a very basic uh, online application form. So I know forms are very, very boring, but I think forms are a huge access to justice barrier, or can be. Um, the, all, you have to, all you have to know to, to believe that's true is to look at any of the rejection rates at any of the courts, uh, pretty much anywhere I go, uh, for forms. The bounce rate is huge. It's huge for lawyers, if we're honest. It's even higher, much higher for lay people. Uh, and that's, of course, because forms are not used, used are not created using human-centered design. They, are, they tend to be the, the product of court administrators, judges, and potentially a few lawyers who consider what the business needs of the court are, but don't really uh, understand it from the perspective of the user. So we've again designed this uh, with community legal advocates. We user test it with the public. And our rule is that if something only happens one out of every 100 times, we're not going to put it on the form. Uh, it has to be a very um, vanilla set of questions that we ask for people. There is one exception, though. Um, this is not a question that is going to be relevant for 99% of people, but it will be very, very important for the very small number of people to whom it applies. So we worked with uh, the, a, a few different LGBTQ plus uh, community organizations. We're actually really lucky to have the board chair of one of those organizations as a part-time member. And we worked on formulating this question that asks about people's preferred uh, name and pronouns. And so this is optional information. Uh, we explain why we're asking, and that's really important if you're a public <coughs> institution. Uh, we learn from these advocates that uh, people are rightly skeptical about why you're collecting this information, and we want to be clear that it's so that we can address people respectfully, is not to gather information about people for some other purpose. Um, and this has been uh, very well received by advocates, as you can, can imagine, and I think it's particularly important in an online context where our staff are not seeing people. They don't have the opportunity to ask them directly how would you like me to refer to you or address you, um, all the way through the process. So our tribunal members find it helpful because they're not mis making assumptions about people's gender based on their name, for example. Um, and I think, as far as I know, we're the only court or tribunal in Canada that's doing that right now. We also ask people if they need any accommodation through the process. Uh, this is also optional, but if somebody tells us they have literacy issues, uh, they don't speak English as a first language, they have a mental health issue, which is a very common um, indication that we get here, or a visual or hearing impairment, or just anything else that may impact their ability to participate, um, they can let us know. And what happens is one of our frontline staff members will contact the person and work with them to develop an accommodation plan. Um, this sounds perhaps more work intensive than it is. It turns out that if you ask people what they need to go through the process, oftentimes the things they ask for are pretty doable. Um, so, for example, a common request for somebody who has a mental health issue might be, can you extend the deadlines? Um, there's days where I just can't, um, I, I can't process this or I, I'm not able to get out of bed. And so that's something we can easily accommodate. For somebody with a visual impairment, it might mean relying more on oral uh, submissions, having an oral mediation, a telephone mediation, or an oral hearing might be the opposite for somebody with a hearing impairment. But we find that just even asking, even if it's not something that we can do, helps build confidence in the process and reduces anxiety. So I'll kind of breeze through some of this because I've covered some of it already. The negotiation um, platform, as I say, is voluntary. People don't have to do it. One of the things we're looking at is how can we use behavioral insights to nudge people to click that button and start talking with each other if they can and they're able to do that. Um, because we know that just talking, even starting to talk, even if you don't reach an agreement at that stage, primes people for being able to reach an agreement in mediation later, which is the next stage. And mediation is mandatory in our process. You don't have to reach an agreement, but you do have to participate in good faith. It's really central to the tribunal in a lot of ways. And that's a key difference from some court annexed mediation projects in Canada, where mediation can sometimes be seen by lawyers to be a bit of a a speed bump or a thing to get around on the way to the judge. 
Um, that's not the case here. The legislation is structured to give a lot of authority to the mediators. And as just one example of that, if somebody is not participating in good faith, they're not um, meeting timelines set by the mediator, they're not producing documents required by the mediator, or otherwise uh, just not complying with the mediator's direction, the mediator can ask the tribunal member to issue a non-compliance order, which can uh, include a range of consequences up to and including dismissal of the claim. Um, this isn't something that happens lightly. This happens after the mediator has given many, many warnings, and the parties have to have an opportunity to provide submissions on that, but it is a way that the tribunal member can support the mediation process. Really flexible. Most people choose to participate by email, but uh, telephone mediation is a pretty common option too. The goal is to figure out what's going to work best for the parties. So if somebody is not very comfortable with technology, um, you do what that person can do. Um, you don't force people who are not comfortable with technology to participate in an email mediation if, they're, if they can't. It's going to be just annoying for everybody um, and not fair to that person. So it's very flexible. There's a lot of choice about how people can work on their dispute. Um, but I don't think it's surprising that a lot of people choose email for a few reasons. One is that you have time to think about it. If you get a settlement offer, you have time to cool down before you respond or talk to a friend or family member or get legal advice. Um, and all of those things promote a respectful communication and also increase the settlement rate in our experience. Last but not least, you have adjudication. Uh, this is for the small minority of disputes that can't settle along the way. We have 14 full-time tribunal members. That's slated to go up to 75 full-time tribunal members two years from now, very gradually over time. Um, we've previously relied more on part-time members, but uh, given the nature of motor vehicle disputes, it's quite difficult to navigate the conflicts that can arise there. Uh, we also have found that having full-time tribunal members really helps to create a center of excellence. It improves quality assurance. It's hard to get really good at decision writing when you're doing a couple of disputes a month. Um, our tribunal members are all experienced lawyers. They've all gone through a very rigorous appointment process. To date, mostly the hearings have been through written submissions, but I expect with motor vehicle disputes we'll have more oral hearings, and those happen via Skype. Um, people participate from their homes, from their smartphones or whatever device they have, usually in concert with tel uh, telephone conferencing as well, because Skype can be a bit unreliable, as I think you noted uh, as well, Hazel. Um, but the idea here is that the tribunal member is in charge of making sure the hearing is fair. And so if they determine that it's not fair in that circumstance uh, to only rely on written submissions, then they'll call an oral hearing instead. Um, I think I've mentioned everything else except to say that our decisions are mostly emailed to the parties and then usually the same day are uploaded onto our website through a very searchable database. We've got about 1,300 decisions up there right now and we're establishing a separate collection for motor vehicle disputes. They're also, at the same time, published on Canly, which is our version of Bailey. Uh, we have an API with Canly, and so they're pipelined there as well. Um, we publish our statistics every month. In part, this is because it's really important to be transparent, obviously, um, about what it is we're doing and how we're working. And we're adding more and more data points over time. So we'll be making this a lot more exhaustive in the coming months. So transparency is one reason. The other reason, though, is that when we were starting to build the tribunal before we opened, we were given both the blessing and the curse of a blank slate. And the blessing part of that is that you can design this thing using empirical evidence. We could design it around advocates. We could use human-centered design. We didn't have to change a culture. We could build a culture. Um, but when we went looking for that empirical evidence, we didn't find a whole lot. There wasn't a lot of good data about how it was the court system was working or why it was working that way. And this is a frustration not only that I have, but pretty much every legal researcher I think in Canada has, and I know it's not unique to Canada either. Um, so our contribution to this, we hope, is by transparently and rigorously publishing data as much as possible. Um, but I've come to the view over the last year, particularly from speaking with Natalie and, and Hazel, that it's really important for us to incorporate more demographic data here too. Um, it's something that we were initially not keen on doing because people don't like answering questions. And we know that the more questions we ask people, the bigger the drop off rate is. But we are, going to, we are starting to implement uh, randomized control trials so that 
We ask a subset of people, a subset of questions, and we've already incorporated that into some of the user satisfaction surveys that we do uh, and other work. So that's really just a disclaimer that this is pretty bare bones, but we're going to be adding a lot more to it over time. So every, every month we uh, uh, add our stats. If you scrolled down here, you'd see this broken down by dispute area. There's a very lonely number two under motor vehicle disputes. Um, but on the whole, we've resolved over or handled over 11,000 disputes. And we're resolving them pretty quickly now. Um, we're resolving small claims disputes in about four months or under. Uh, by comparison, our provincial court, which handles the next tier of disputes, is at about eight to 11 months. We also survey people who have been through the process and ask them uh, what they thought of it. And I think this goes to Margaret's notion of procedural justice versus substantive justice. The substantive justice part is partly our responsibility. It's obviously our responsibility to make the best decisions we can based on the law. But it's also the responsibility of court because all our decisions are subject to judicial review. But the procedural uh, part of that, we think, um, requires us to ask people about their experience, that it's not just have we met the requirements of procedural fairness, but do people feel that they were treated fairly through the process? And there's some really interesting research about how that affects people's perception of the outcome, um, how they were treated. And uh, so every month we publish our user satisfaction rates. They fluctuate, often depending on how many responses, but warts are all, we, we publish them every month. And on the whole, we tend to get pretty good scores on things like the CRT treated me fairly throughout the process. Um, CRT staff were professional. Um, the easy to use and uh, information piece fluctuates often depending on the kind of case type. But that's an area where we do more and more research because a, a lot of the gold here is in the comments. It's not even in the, the statistics. Like the statistics are helpful from a directional perspective, but every month the sample size is still pretty low. But the comments are really, really important. So we pass on the pats on the back to our staff, but the constructive feedback also goes into the treasure trove and also becomes a source of continuous improvement. And I'll just wrap up here by starting with one of the points I made at the beginning, which is that online dispute resolution, I think by itself, does not increase access to justice. Digitalizing things does not necessarily increase access to justice, and in fact, it does worse things by just entrenching already bad processes. Um, but what I think online dispute resolution does, again, is invite us to reconsider absolutely everything that we do in the justice system. And that freedom of thought, I think, is really exciting. And it gives us opportunities to improve things online, but also to improve things offline. One of the first things I did when I was appointed in 2014 was I met with these community legal advocates you've heard me talking about. I invited myself into their metaphorical living rooms. I met with their clients. I chatted with them. Um, often I did that in the face of quite a lot of skepticism because, candidly, their experience with public sector IT projects has been that their clients have been disenfranchised. Um, and I would ask them, you know, what are the things that you would do to change the justice system if we could construct it around your clients? What would you ask for? And I was expecting these really big ticket items that I'd not be able to implement at all. But it was kind of gutting that a lot of the things they asked for were pretty doable. You know, can you make sure that your staff all have training in mental health issues? Can you make sure that they have cultural competency training? Um, can you make this an easy place for me to be an advocate by making a welcoming place for helpers? Um, one of the things that surprised me is they asked for a direct phone line to somebody at the tribunal who could fix things if their clients were falling through the cracks. So they all have um, my registrar and executive director's uh, cell phone number, Richard Rogers. He was not super excited that I gave them all <laughs> the, uh, the cell phone number. But he tells me that nobody has actually called. But I think, I think having that, knowing that you've got a lineup of people outside your office, and they all get half an hour of summary advice, and you are dealing with the system that's not working for your client, knowing that you have a cell phone number of somebody who can uh, troubleshoot that for you is really helpful. I think it really respects the fact that uh, advocates are under-resourced and uh, have a lot of pressures. We also have free telephone interpretation in over 200 languages, including several indigenous languages, which is particularly important uh, given Canada's horrific uh, history of, of treatment of its indigenous people. And one little example I'll end on with respect to the dangers of the lack of empirical evidence in our justice system is about fee waivers. 
So in Canada, or at least in British Columbia, if you are low income, on a low income and need to get your court fees waived, you still have to go to court, make a chamber's application, gather up all the supporting documents you can to try and prove that you have a low income, and you have to lay yourself bare in front of a gallery of lawyers mostly uh, and other people. And when I went looking for why this was, because we were designing our own fee waiver process, I couldn't find a single piece of evidence that supports that process. I couldn't find an epidemic of people trying to fraudulently get fees waived. Um, quite the opposite, what I found was a lot of people not applying because it was A, not respectful of human dignity, and B, just massively onerous. And so I can't still figure out why it is we force people to do that. Um, even if all you cared about was court resources, it doesn't seem like a good use of time or money. So what we did was worked with community advocates again, and we said, well, we have two assumptions. One, there's not an epidemic of fraud here. And two, we know people with a low income have intersecting barriers to accessing justice, and you cannot ask reasonably somebody to go and get tax information or bank information on public transit and collect all this information and send it to you. Um, so instead, what we designed was um, a really simple form. You click that you're on a government assistance program or you enter your household income you press submit and you get your fee waiver. Uh, if it turns out your car accident involved a Lamborghini some way down the way, we'll, we'll maybe ask for documents. But that's not a thing that happens. It's not a thing that has happened. But it's an example of how, at some point, we got this idea that we have to do it this way. And we've created this huge hurdle for people that's entirely unsupported by any evidence. So again, a call for better data, which you've heard already a lot today. So I think we do have a little bit of time for questions or comments. Love to get your feedback. Uh, if we don't get to your question today, please shoot me an email. This will, this generic email address, it will get to the right person. Uh, and we're pretty active on social media as well. We've been tweeting up a storm already this morning. Um, so with that, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you. Uh, to Nina Rostain from Georgetown Law Center. So I have two questions. And the first one actually relates to uh, the solution screener advisor that you have at the beginning, which is that there's an assumption, and I have this problem too when I build apps in my class, there's an assumption that you can sort of figure out discrete legal problems and that they're not usually connected to other legal problems. And this is an issue that I struggle with. So for instance, um, in the United States, if you win a big judgment in a personal injury, uh, action is going to affect, you're going to have to pay taxes on it, it's going to affect your eligibility for different kinds of public benefits, et cetera, et cetera. And that one of the roles that lawyers play when they're available is to be able to connect all those dots in order to give advice and explain uh, to a would-be uh, plaintiff in a case what, how all those uh, getting different benefits or different, uh, uh, a recovery might affect different benefits that they have. So that's one question. A second question I have um, is how do you deal with imbalances of power and repeat players gaming the system? So example, and I don't know anything about condominium law in Canada, in British Columbia, my apologies, but if there are cases involving landlords, I can imagine a system where the landlord um, is using certain kind of uh, 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 harassment uh, in order to get li rid of tenants, that they do it on a repeated basis. They know how to use the online dispute resolution to get the tenants settled and then move them and then get them out. And or they know how to do things in ways that benefit them at, at the expense of other people that they're they're negotiating with. And that without sort of more systemic. Uh, uh, without lawyers who are collecting more systemic data about landlord practices or patterns or systemic abuses, that uh, that kind of uh, conduct is not going to be addressed. And I don't know enough about law in BC to know, uh, but I'm curious to know. I, I know you've thought about all these pieces already. No, I, I, I'll start with your second uh, question, which I, I take your general point, which is how do you deal with uh, imbalances of power uh, generally? And I think the reality is that sophisticated parties know how to work any system. Um, that's kind of the problem, right? And so to the extent that you can make the system a lot more accessible and, and to the extent you can correct information asymmetries, 
people are gonna be better off than they would be where those asymmetries are more pronounced. So it's, it's not perfect at all. It's more accessible for everybody, um, but the truth is that the more money and education and resources you have, the more successful you can navigate the court system. Um, so to the extent that you can give people uh, a bit of an even playing field, to the extent that we're able to, that's, that's our overall goal. Um, we, do have a, we do have some repeat, uh, I guess, institutional parties. So small claims includes low value lenders, payday lenders. It includes um, you know, other financial institutions. Uh, but I think as a general point, because you do sometimes hear this argument, if you, if you make divorce online, isn't everybody going to get a divorce? If you uh, make it easy to, I actually did hear that comment at a, at a conference last year. Um, if, you, if you make it uh, you know, easy for everybody to hop over the fence and file claims, aren't you going to have a floodgate of, uh, open the floodgates to frivolous claims? And I think the answer to that is to the extent that there needs to be regulatory reform to correct rights imbalances, that goes to Margaret's point that that's, that's an important piece of policy and legislative work. But I don't think the solution is to choke the access to justice funnel because then you catch everybody in the net to make some metaphors there. Uh, the second uh, question that you, sorry, your first question again was? About how the legal issues are not necessarily. Right, easily discreetly right. detached, that's true. But the fact is, again, I, this is, you're going to hear this broken record about the perfect being the enemy of the good. Mostly the people who are using the Solution Explorer are not people who are going to go and see a lawyer or can certainly pay to see a lawyer. So there's no claim here about the, at all that the Solution Explorer can replace a lawyer or is as good as getting legal advice necessarily. But what it is is better than randomly Googling condominium law or debt law and trying yourself to piece together what the law is in those areas. There are points where we provide information to non-legal services where we think, well, somebody's got a real problem here, but it's not one that the law can solve. Um, but in my ideal world, my ideal virtual world where, uh, where I could reconfigure things, there would be no wrong door that we would seamlessly be able to connect people either through helpers or a combination of helpers and, and expert systems and other things to where they needed to go, whether it was credit counseling or health services or wherever they needed to go so that you don't have the kind of referral fatigue that people have. But you're absolutely right that, of course, legal problems compound and intersect with all kinds of other problems, too. Shannon, one of the uh, streams this afternoon, or the ODR stream this afternoon, is looking at the benefits of building something from the ground up versus the digitalization of existing courts. Yes. And could you provide some reflections on that and also perhaps give us a bit of an insight into how the decision was made in British yeah. Columbia to build something from the ground up because it seems like yeah. a, to me that was a really crucial dis decision in, cre in creating something so successful. Yeah, I think you've already heard me rant a little bit about the dangers of digitalizing existing processes, and you see that in a lot of jurisdictions where uh, you know you have very touted e-court, e e-filing, e-discovery projects, which. This may be controversial, but I don't think those really do anything to increase access to justice for everyday people. They may make life a little bit easier for lawyers, some lawyers maybe, and some paralegals, but they do not fundamentally reimagine and reconfigure the justice system so it's built around people, mm. uh, the people who have to use it. And doing that is much, much harder than taking your forms and making them PDF fillable or allowing people to upload uh, evidence electronically. It is hard, it's humbling, it's exasperating, it's very frustrating, but it has to be done. And my anxiety is that to the extent that we focus on those kind of projects and then their twin, which is other buffer projects uh, that do, not, do nothing to reform fundamentally the public justice system, but do create a plethora of apps by which you can navigate that horribly dysfunctional system, that that too just serves to uh, further disenfranchised people in some ways, despite the best intentions of a lot of those projects, it's not those people's fault. I think there's lots of brilliant apps and, and, every, and the hearts are in the right places, but the obligation has to be on the public justice system to reform. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be the case that we're creating concentric circles around it because the, the citizen's just completely unable to navigate it the way it is. Mm -hmm. Because 
I mean, that's basi basically what TurboTax does, right? Um, at least in Canada, the, the tax forms are incomprehensible to most people. And so all tur TurboTax does is creates a buffer between those forms and the person by asking them simple questions and then turning around and filling out those incomprehensible forms, which is also what a lot of these, the legal apps do. In an ideal world, world, you wouldn't need that because the system itself had reformed. Yeah, Rich has a question. Th thanks very much. That was uh, exactly what we all needed to hear, in my view, about what can actually be achieved. I wonder if you're being too modest about saying it doesn't increase access to justice. That, and in fact, I think I've heard you say otherwise. Um, if, if you go back to my own model of access to justice, uh, does it, for example, help uh, people uh, put the fence at the top of the cliff? I think your solution explorer probably does. Does it attempt to... And, uh, I think it, I'm sure it does. Does it uh, attempt to help people mediate or or negotiate? I, I think the the involvement on your second or third level does involve. Mm -hmm. And thirdly, are more people enforcing their entitlements? I, I don't know the answer to that as an empirical question, but my my sense is it probably would do. So you, you two or three times were at pains where you. Oh, I'll, I'll I'll clarify my statement. What I meant was that I don't think ODR by itself. Yeah increases access to justice. I think, for example, we could have taken the condominium jurisdiction we were given and designed something at about a university level, reading level, because that's the average condominium owner, and made it uh, much simpler from a design perspective, but really only accessible to a pretty rarefied group of people. Now that's ODR. There's no map, ODR itself doesn't increase access to justice. I think ODR can create a framework where you can absolutely increase access to justice. and I would humbly suggest that the CRT has done that. Um, but I guess my overall point is that it, it needs to be intentionally designed yes. for everybody. Um, that you can make design decisions that render ODR useless from any access to justice perspective. Yes. I, I draw a distinction, incidentally, and again, it's just one of these distinctions that I find helpful, others might not, but between online courts and on and ODR, because ODR includes a lot of online dispute resolution that's not public state-based system. Yeah. So it seems to me what's different and exciting about what you're doing is it's, it's part of the yeah. state-provided system, whereas a lot of ODR is essentially electronic ADR. Yeah. Uh, and it's not at all clear to me that that actually does increase access to justice, whereas online courts almost certainly do. I agree with you, and I think they're related to this, this rant I just went through about the concentric circles and the buffer. I think another danger of n failing to reform the public system is that w we're going to create even more of a vacuum which will be filled by p private ODR. Um, but what that means is that private ODR startup uh, can pick its market segment. You can say, I'm offering divorce services to high net worth individuals, or I'm offering uh, this targeted service to some other segment. And that's their right as private sector bodies. My obligation is to make sure that people aren't falling through the cracks. Um, why is that my obligation? Because we're a part of the public justice system. And so that worries me too, that if the pu public system fails to evolve, uh, you, you create basically nothing for most people and something expensive for those who can afford it. I fully agree. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Shannon. That was, thank you. That was fantastic. I think, oh, um, do we take one more question? Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, um, Margaret Hagen sort of uh, alluded to behavioral insight, and you specifically mentioned nudge. And I was wondering, was that something that was intentional when you were starting to create it, that you wanted to put this into your building blocks? Or did it just sort of come as happenstance when you're creating something that people end up using and you want to make more efficient? Candidly, I think it, it was always something that uh, we were turning our mind to, but not in the kind of disciplined way that it's now available. So you know, we, we put a lot of thought into, well, how do we phrase this in a way that is going to seem friendly or reduce anxiety or those kinds of things? But now, of course, there are, there's a huge amount of science. There are a lot of different case studies for this. It's something that most private companies are doing, right? That's how they get us to use online banking instead of paper or, or do other things that are good for their bottom line. Our curiosity is, how do we create incentives uh, for people to do what we probably paternalistically think is best for them. And that's an ethically fraught thing to do in the public justice sector. It's arguably fraught anyway, but we have to be particularly careful. So our test case for this was the negotiation phase because it's voluntary. And we know that to the extent people can reach an agreement, they tend to be happier 
Um, it's better for their health, it's better for their finances. So we were looking at how do we word our invitation letter to encourage people to click on that link and start talking? How can we coach them through negotiations so that they're not using language that's antagonistic or is gonna reduce their chances of settlement? And we did work with PwC to develop a toolkit for that. It hasn't been implemented yet, um, but it is something we're thinking about. And it has, I think, a lot of promise. And if, in case some of you are horrified by this, because it, it can be sort of seen as a bit manipulative, if you step back from the civil justice system, it already has baked in a ton of incentives and disincentives. But they tend to be ones that have cr been created for and work for particular actors and don't necessarily work all that well for the public. Um, so to the extent that we can agree on what is desirable, um, hopefully using empirical evidence, and then ethically find ways to encourage people to resolve their disputes, that's something that I think is definitely worth looking at, and we are looking at it. So Shannon, I just want to come back to one of the questions that Nick asked, but in terms of how this came about, if you could name like one thing that happened in British Columbia to really create this, or what was the motivating factor, what would it be? That's a good question, and I sometimes get asked if there's something special about British Columbia mm -hmm. that this happened. The best I can come up with seeing jurisdictions that have been successfully able to implement public sector ODR and ones that haven't is it just seems to be the right combination of decision makers at the right time. Uh, we happen to have a, a government at the time, and the government's changed, but still this government, that was very committed to this, was willing to deal with angry lawyers, frankly, or other justice system <laughs> actors, um, was willing for it to be unpopular in some circumstances, and uh, saw it through legislatively and then stood by it. So I think it, it does require uh, change leaders in leadership positions who are willing to suffer the slings and arrows and, and, and do it anyway. Um, and and it, that's a really tough combination of circumstances. I think you had also asked why this was developed as a tribunal instead of a court. And I think the idea, again, is it was a blank slate. Administrative tribunals have more flexibility procedurally. They can be more agile. They can also be the product of legislation, whereas our courts are const our senior courts are constitutionally um, derived. So I, I think there was the ability to have a bit of a, a sandbox in that context that would have been very difficult within established institutions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, thank you very much, Shannon. That was really excellent, and thank you for sharing everything that's going on. And there's a, for people who are interested in online dispute resolution, there is a whole stream on online dispute resolution this afternoon, so lots of opportunities to have more conversations.